Yeah, yeah. Hey there. This is Res Mason coming at you live from the skybox in the corner of the level. As usual, we are trying to make this thing run real fast. It's been a couple episodes since I've gone through like the mission statement, so I just figure I'm gonna kick things off with that. This thing's called Wireworld. It is characterized by intricate patterns of pixels that have only four colors, and those colors follow rules, four simple rules. And by following those four rules universally, um, you can create complex machines that perform logical operations on signals. So why am I doing this? Um, well, I did it 10 years ago, and I gotta do it again, because 10 years ago I used Flash, and Flash is gone. And I still want to uh, share this concept. This is somebody else's idea, by the way. Uh, the concept of Wireworld was the invention of Brian Silverman uh, in, I think, the 70s or 80s. And the Wireworld computer, which we were looking at back there, is the work of David Moore and Mark Owen in, uh, I think, 1992. Um, but these, these ideas are hard to share on the web unless you have a web app that makes it real straightforward. What's nice about a web app is you don't have to install it. You just go to the website, resmason.github.io Wireworld Player. Boom, it's right there. And you're off to the races. Someone who's never seen this before can get a sense of what it's all about just by looking at it. Like any other website. Um, there is no online alternative. Not really. And I kind of feel a personal responsibility for making it a passion project that fell to the wayside. Or really, I just had other things I was doing for these past 10 years, and I want this to outlive Flash. The point of this stream is to program in a language that is at least JavaScript-like in public, so that when I write this code, um, this code, I'm not asking the world of you, the spectator, to follow along. Um, and who knows, uh, while I learn something live, because I don't know everything, maybe you will learn something too. From my plans, from my mistakes, if you think you can do better than I am on this project, I encourage you, I invite you to fork it. Um, let's see. But yeah, mistakes, I mean, we're going to see. Mistakes happen on the stream all the time. And that's an important thing to demonstrate regularly in public. Um, and while I'm at it, I like just hyping Wireworld. This is a really cool thing. And I wish more people knew that systems like this exist. Um, well, that's a, that's a bug. <laughs> That is a live bug. Play. That works. Slow it down. Breaks. I'll look into that. I'm going to add that to our to-do list right at the top. Um, wait. Why is the speed slider... Why does the speed slider break play pause? A very good question. Hunting down bugs, implementing features, um, playing a simulation, uh, explaining how a system works. All of these are types of storytelling that I am interested in weaving together uh, live without any kind of um, self-censorship. Other than curse words, I hope I haven't accidentally said any curse words these past seven episodes. Anyway, um, I've discussed that. We'll go over the four rules of Wireworld real quick. Um, but yeah, 
The guiding principles for this project are the code that I'm writing should be readable, simple, and practical. I hope I'm, I'm, uh, I hope I'm doing that. Um, it should be accessible. The, the app should be accessible. It should be easy to use. Right? Trying to use common uh, concepts that describe how it works. Um, and what we've been focusing on for the past few episodes is to make it fast. Um, we've done a bunch of Wireworld specific optimization strategies. Uh, there's a couple more that I've never tried before that uh, just blow everything we've done so far completely out of the water. Like orders of magnitude faster. Um, but they might take a few episodes for me to actually successfully implement. But in the meantime, we've done a bunch of this and now we are doing um, JavaScript speeded up strategies. During the last episode, we put the engine, the thing that does all of the important number crunching, we put that in a web worker. Uh, if we get to it, we might experiment with off-screen canvas tonight, but probably not because we just, I, I don't know. I'm not sure how long the, uh, we might have a full plate already, uh, but that would be a cool thing to attempt. Um, and of course, uh, WebAssembly, which is a bytecode that is as universal as JavaScript in the latest versions of all browsers, um, but doesn't have the design decisions that went into JavaScript that make it um, hard to optimize. And so maybe by writing the engine in WebAssembly, we can get some additional performance gains. Um, I want this whole thing to be as transparent as possible. If we look at the source code for the, uh, for the web app, it's weird. Tell you what, maybe there's a and breakout. Here we go. You know, this is in Safari. This is in the browser. Um, there's no weird obfuscation shenanigans that you'll see on the sites that are generated by, you know, server-side renderers that do like weird things with tags. All of this is supposed to be a really transparent um, single page app where you can just get a sense of what all there is. Um, in a real straightforward manner. And then uh, I just did this apparently, like last week, I, I apparently introduced a bug where if you slow it down, it, uh, it breaks it. But otherwise, you don't wanna break the live build um, and don't share personal info by mistake. Right, so before we dive in, what again are the four rules of Wireworld? They are, here we are dead cells, which are these ones in the background, dead, cell, dead cells never change. If you see this black color in the image, that pixel will never change color. It is always, always, always going to be that color. Uh, and these, they are prominent. They are everywhere. They kind of force the rest of the simulation into these intricate grooves, which is great. Uh, it's controlled chaos. The rest of the cells oscillate between tail cells, head cells, and wire cells. Most of the cells at any given time are wire cells in most images. Um, they are interconnected and they are intended to propagate signals that are made from head and tail cells that move along like so. You'll notice that this uh, electron head and tail pair has the head, the orange pixel on the left, and the tail, the yellow pixel on the right. Uh, it moves to the left, it moves in the direction uh, that the head is facing in that tail. Whereas this one, the head is on the right side, it moves to the right. Um, 
that isn't a rule. Uh, we'll talk about that propagation in a minute. But also we'll, we'll notice here that heads and tails do some interesting things. Um, you know, this, this mess of cells is not exactly a, an electron uh, head-tail pair, right? It, in fact, kind of disappears or it spreads in weird ways. And that's all based on the following logic. Every time you see a cell, so all these yellow cells, like these, like these three right here, they always become wire in the next generation, like that. Yellow always becomes wire. And head, the orange, always becomes yellow. Once again, head, yellow. And so in a way, a head with a tail next to it is propagating to the neighboring wires but can't propagate backwards because it bumps into the tail. The point of the tail is to keep the head pointed forward. The most interesting thing though is when wires become heads. So you'll see here, this wire is next to a head, this wire is next to a head, this wire, this wire, they are next to these head cells and they, two of them, sorry, this wire and this wire and this wire became heads. This one did not. And that is because a wire becomes a head if it has one or two head neighbors. So this was a wire cell that had one head neighbor. These two also had one head neighbor. This one had one, two, three head neighbors. And so at least in this moment, it wasn't possible for this head to propagate to this cell. I've spent a lot of time in previous episodes explaining how these rules allow for the formation of logic gates uh, and more intricate designs. Um, so I'm not gonna go into that this time. That is what we are making, and that is why we are making it. Let's fix that bug before we proceed with our plan. Um, recap what happened after the end of the last stream. Okay, right. Why does the speed slider break play pause? Okay. Do I want to use the web inspector to test this? I think I want to use the console to test this. Um, engine. Let's see. Timing. Set rhythm. Start turbo. Run. Run. Console.log. Running at speed plus speed. So this. Whoops. So this should spit out running at speed a whole bunch of times. And then when I change the slider, there we go. It is no longer running at any speed. Interesting. So set rhythm, console.log, set rhythm, plus rhythm data. Oh, right, object, object. So comma. Okay, so set rhythm, speed one, playing false. That's interesting, hang on. This should have playing, f okay, playing true, playing false. Playing true, playing false. But they all have speed one because that is the value of this slider. And then I slide it, and now set rhythm, speed 0.6, and then playing. There we go, start timeout in timing. 
Start timeout. What do you mean can't find variable start timeout? Start timeout? Oh, it should be set timeout. <sighs> Let's see. Set rhythm. Playing. Slow. Play. That works. That didn't work. So, timeout ID is null. Okay. My attempt to make like a balanced if else if structure here uh, introduced a bug. That's what happened. There's logic here that should be causing another call to run, but it's not. So, if playing and was. Okay, else if playing, if turbo, else if. else um geez should i rewrite this i probably should just thinking through it What I ought to do, that's annoying to do, is determine all of the differences in the rhythm data. But recompute delay, delay milliseconds. If playing else, timeout ID. Okay. This is what I should do. So right now I'm, I've got stop. Yeah, I basically have this tacit const stop equals. And so right now I'm calling that, which I shouldn't. Instead, it should be there. If playing and wasn't playing, right? If wasn't, if isn't playing and was playing, if turbo, else, stop. Okay. Interesting. It's becoming more symmetrical. Else if playing. If turbo changed, start turbo and stop. If turbo changed back, stop turbo, run. I think this is right. Gotta test it. Cool. That's weird. Why is it so slow in that moment? Um, because of all the console logs, probably. Well, maybe not. Let's find out. No, it's just kind of slow. Is it because it's also... Oh, no, 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 no. It's slow for the reason that I haven't described yet. Okay. Not at all worried. Good times. Okay, we fixed that bug. We're just gonna... that. Okay. Um, and run prettier. Probably not necessary. Exactly. Okay. Fixing a bug in timing. 
where the logic to stop the slow timer was improperly called. Let's just call it that. Or should I name it after the bug I fixed? Yeah, let's rename it. Okay. Amend. Fixing a bug in timing. A logic mix-up in set rhythm caused changes in speed to terminate the set timeout loop. Set timeout and request animation frame loops. That's more like it. Okay. Push that. Right, so. I try not to have a bunch of computers lying around. I don't think it's realistic for someone to teach someone else how to use a computer and have like a million computers be part of my workflow. That's, that's ridiculous. N nobody has a million computers. Most people have a maximum of one computer. What this means is, in the name of minimalism, I am streaming from the same, web, uh, same machine that I'm programming on. And what that means is the system resources, so these are some CPU meters, one for each core in my machine, um, they are being divided between uh, the code I am trying to, you know, improve the performance of. Oh, that's a bit better. Eh. Between the performance of the Wireworld player and the performance of my streaming and recording. Once I turn off streaming and recording, the performance of this thing skyrockets. You can try it for yourself, but... One of the problems with the code in the engine, as it's currently written, is that we have some hard-coded assumptions that we will isolate, we will separate them out. Um, and uh, different browsers, so there's like, there's an optimization sweet spot that we want to reach where some browsers might not be able to run the simulation as fast as others, but they should all render at like 60 frames per second. We know that we can, um, we know that we can render the, um, the simulation at 60 frames a second. We're doing it right now, right? It's not a problem. Uh, and also, uh, we know that calling update once is not a problem. Uh, the update function is highly optimized. And so, what we should do is call this stuff a whole lot less. So if I change this number to a three, just for now, just for now, and press play and press turbo, we can see it's moving super fast. Where like it's 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 rendering super fast, like it's updating and rendering faster than it is meant to uh, is is set to when it's just um, limited to the the rate at which we can update the display. So we can go much faster like that. But um, these magic numbers, so like this is not very fast, right? This isn't. This is three times or not three times faster. It's, it's faster than uh, 60 frames a second, but we know that we can go faster still. We just have to have different goals for different uh, runtimes. Um, 
So we'll do that this uh, this episode. Also, we need a metric because right now we don't actually know how fast it's running. So here's what I'm gonna do. In the corner here, in the bottom right corner of the app, there's an unused label. Well, it's empty, so it has no dimensions. Let me go into it. Um, bottom right. Here we go. There is a label that I've called frame rate. We're actually going to rename it because <clears throat> frame rate suggests the rate at which something is drawn. And we're going to have a fixed frame rate. <clears throat> so instead of frame rate, we're going to call it simulation speed. And it is going to be, excuse me one second. I got to cough a whole bunch. <clears throat> right. So, just continue. Okay. Uh, get weird. Okay. So, we are going to give a number to this qualitative value that we've just been kind of spitballing for the past six episodes. We really want to know how many generations we can simulate per second. And that's going to go down here. And I'm going to change that. Uh, before I change that, what other changes have there been since... Just hide my experimental branch. There we go. So we ended the last episode here. So, uh, right, computers sure run faster when they're not also live streaming and recording. Um, I got rid of some commented out code. I was experimenting with getting the timing just right for my machine for Safari which again, is not ideal for everywhere. Um, and then in timing, I... Huh, I actually got rid of stop running. Okay, so the bug that we just fixed is one that I introduced after the last streams, uh, after we ended the last stream. That's, that's embarrassing. Okay. Um, and then after that is just, uh... Right. Um, performance. So you might recall in Turbo, we are comparing uh, the current time with the last time that we rendered. And this is the way that we make sure that we render often enough for things to look um, updated in the main thread, right? The rate at which this updates is based on the idea that the time since the last render is greater than 20 milliseconds. And this again is just a magic number that we should give a name, and we should make more. Uh, we should, you know, fine tune. Um, I was basing this math on performance.now, which is a float, and I, I'm not entirely sure how it's generated. What I do know is date.now is much faster, um, and so uh, doing the math based on that saves us a little bit of performance. Although again, you're just gonna have to take my word for it because whatever. So let's let's fix this up. Um, we're gonna start. Oops. We're gonna start an in index.html. Find that frame rate. We're gonna rename this simulation speed. Title simulation speed um, generations per second. So that's the tooltip, and then span class, boom, span, span class, and then close label. Turn off word wrap. Good. I'm curious what um, curious what Prettier is going to do to that HTML. 
Nothing. Good. Okay. And then in the GUI.js, update paper. So this state generation, uh, sorry, this state.generation and generation label logic, we're going to duplicate this. And the idea is this is going to be um, simulation speed, but it's not called labels dot simulation speed. It's labels simulation underscore speed because of that code that takes the class on these things and replaces the hyphen with an underscore. <coughs> um, what else? Somewhere labels generation. There we go. Uh, yep. And initial state generation zero simulation speed is going to be a string. And it's eventually going to come from these render objects. Like this. Boom. Cool. So now we refresh. For an instant, we saw those three hyphens down here. Play. No surprise, we're not getting any simulation speed value, so we don't see anything. So we should pass this through. So wireworld.js, last render, just looking through. It's queued up. Okay. <clears throat> so that comes straight from the engine. And we're going to create const simulation speed equals. Now this is interesting. We are only interested in showing the simulation speed when turbo is on. So for now we're going to say turbo uh, start turbo. Let's see. Oh, that's not a thing. OK. You know what, for now, we're just going to do that. There we are. So there are our three hyphens. Cool. So we've done this. Uh, we've recapped. We've got the simulation speed. Um, gizmo. Uh, label wired up. Um, just as before, I'm going to go into Turbo, and okay, so let last render is date.now, while true, for, I'm going to change this back to three. No, I'm not. I'm going to give it a name. Step size. Um, and this is just for now. I'm going to move these up in a minute. Const turbo step size equals one. step size. And in here, I'm going to unroll a loop. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, I know this looks gross. Don't don't let it bug you too much. I just want this to be a multiple of six, and I want this to be a power of two, because we're going to be adjusting the step size to um, be a higher or lower power of two. Not yet, though. So let date now, and then this is desired frame time. Const desired frame time equals a thousand milliseconds divided by 60 frames a second. Okay. Looks smooth. It did have a hiccup there. desired frame rate, drop step size to 6, measure and display simulation speed. So how do we do this? We do something like this. Let turbo start, 
turbo start generation. This is going to be turbo start time. Okay. And then let turbo time Nah, that's that's fine. Okay. So turbo start time equals here. I'm just gonna grab this. Okay. Oopsie. Turbo start time is now. Last render is turbo start time. Turbo time. Turbo time equals turbo start time. Okay. And also turbo start generation equals generation. So when turbo activates, we're going to find out what the generation of the simulation was when it started. Turbo start time is going to be the time at which the simulation entered turbo and we will compare that with date dot now. Okay. All true. This is good. And then turbo time is date dot now. Uh, let turbo duration equal turbo time. Oh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. The reason we've got these is so that they can be used up here when we render to get the simulation speed. Okay, so the number of generations that we've simulated in turbo is generation minus turbo start generation. The number of milliseconds we've been in turbo is date dot now minus turbo start time. So we can say we'll just set this to man for now. Uh, is nan. Oh, whoops. Simulation speed equals is nan turbo start time. So if we're not running turbo, we're going to show those three lines. Otherwise, it's going to be number of generations divided by seconds uh, times a thousand. And lastly, math dot round. Let's try that. Here we go. I've got turbo turned on. The simulation is running. And we can see that the simulation is advancing 
at about 450 generations per second. Which looks about right when we watch the generation timer go up. So we've got that. Turbo start time. I'm actually going to move this in. Um, because here's the thing, we want to know exactly how long this takes. So turbo time is turbo start time. Here's what we'll do. Okay. Let turbo time equal turbo start time. Let now equal, well, just now. Okay. So then here, now, and then let diff equal now minus turbo time turbo time equals now so this diff value represents the total amount of time that this took not just these six updates but those six updates times turbo step size Here's what we're going to do. If it's too slow, speed it up. Else if it's too fast, slow it down. So how do we know it's too slow? It's if this diff is a really large number. So diff is greater than min frame time. And so min frame time const min frame time equals I'm going to say we don't want or sorry min frame time diff is greater than max frame time that's what it should be called sorry okay max frame time represents the total number of milliseconds that we will find this loop to be acceptable so if it's too great and Turbo step size is greater than one. So the minimum is going to be one. Oh, I did this all wrong. Hang on. Uh, yeah, I switched these up. Let me do that again. That was stupid. Okay, if it's too slow, speed it up. If it's too fast, slow it down. Const min uh, max frame time equals 1,000 over 10. Okay. If it's too slow, if it's too fast. Okay, I'm going to start with this only because I wrote the code out. If the diff is greater than... Ugh. I'm confusing myself. If it's too slow, in other words, if the diff is greater than max frame time, right? I was doing it right originally. Okay. So this means that it's cr it's it's simulating too fast. Like it's sorry, it's simulating too many times. 
Um, so if the amount of time that this takes is greater than the maximum allowed, and we can reduce turbo step size, then turbo step size uh, divided by equals 2. Another way of saying this is bit shift equals 1. Have it. Uh, have is a verb, right? Probably. Having. Okay. To divide into two equal parts. Perfect. Else if it's too fast. So in this case, it's kind of like um, diff times two is less than max frame time. In other words, the the, the slowest acceptable update loop is still twice as long as the current diff, then turbo step size bit shift left one, double it. Let's try this out. Okay. So now we can see, so the, the web app is responsive, right? We can see it's advancing pretty quickly. Um, it's got Huh, hang on. Simulation speed keeps going down, so I wonder if it's being miscalculated. Hard to tell. Maybe it was originally being miscalculated, which makes sense because the numerator and sorry the uh, the denominator and the numerator of this um, this meter are uh, increasing over time, and so the oh you guys can't even see it because there we go. Sorry about that. This value, this number here. And we are maxing out two of my cores. But it does mean that however fast uh, it can run on a system, it will reach that speed. It looks like it's at around 850. Oh, you know what? It's not 850, it's 850 times six. Okay, so here I'm gonna say const um, Turbo multiplier equals six. And then four let j equal zero, j is less than turbo multiplier, j plus plus. Okay. Um, Oh, no, no, no. I'm wrong. It doesn't care about the structure of this loop. It only cares about the start generation and the current generation. So, while I'm streaming and while I'm recording my screen, the speed at which this simulation updates is about 850 um, generations per second in Safari. So now we can try it in a different browser. In my personal experience, Firefox has been much slower. I'm not 100% sure why, but I have some weird theories that are probably wrong. 
Let's see how it does. It's really struggling. When I'm not streaming, it reaches speeds of about 850 or 900. Safari reaches speeds of about 2400, um, as does Chrome. But while I'm streaming, this is the best that it can do. So at least we are optimizing the speed of the engine based on the situation that it is running in. Okay. <sighs> now then, we've got that. We're only an hour in, so we might actually try off-screen canvas. Um, now, one other thing that we did in the last episode was we built all of this stuff on top of this idea that the engine should just, um, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. That the engine, as a worker, should just be, like, abandoned any time turbo is turned on, because it enters an infinite loop. And the hope was, right, by going into this wild true that is inescapable, that can only be ended from outside of the worker, the hope was there'd be a performance benefit. Well, now we can actually test for that. We can do this. Um, here. Instead of wild true, we'll say const loop equals, there we go. So now we have a function called loop and set interval loop zero. So if we do this and we see the same performance, then we know that we are not actually benefiting from this weird idea of uh, trapping the web worker in a while loop. Well, I'm not 100% sure, because it's still um, oscillating, but this value is at least as much as the simulation speed when it wasn't in a while loop forever. In other words, that cool idea I had of sticking the thing in a while loop forever um, is not actually valuable. And what that means is we can receive messages while Turbo is running, after all. Which is cool. Um, so what all do we have to do? Well, we're going to change some things around. Turbo is going to be renamed Start Turbo. Actually, rather than that, we will, sorry, one second. We're going to commit this, which is to of the engine web worker by modulating the speed it runs at to maximize generations per second. Within a given period of time.
Is that a decent exp Improve the performance. Improving the performance of the web worker. In turbo mode. It adjusts the simulation speed until going any faster. Causes it to it adjusts the simulation speed within a time budget of ten hertz. And is guaranteed to render at 60 hertz. That's more like it. And push. Okay. So now let's get into this um, replacing this while loop with a um, set interval zero. And this is going to be called the turbo, actually. Do I want set interval? No, I want set timeout. Okay. Const loop turbo equals and then loop turbo. And then down here, set timeout. Um, turbo timeout equals set timeout turbo zero. And then turbo timeout goes up here. Let turbo timeout. Then what? Well, first let's test this. Yep. Cool. Um, but now we want to get away from this idea that turbo, once you start it, you can't stop it. So we're going to call this start turbo break. And we're going to also have one called stop turbo. So this we're going to change into start turbo. Okay, and then const stop turbo equals um, clear timeout turbo timeout turbo timeout equals null. The reason I did nan here, I don't know, I'll just do null. The reason I had done nan was to keep it like still a number, but this isn't where like null is a different type than number in JavaScript. So by changing turbo start times value between null and number, I'm arguably deoptimizing something. I'm not gonna over I'm not gonna overthink it though. Not going to worry about that. Let. Okay. Start turbo. Cool. Loop turbo can just live in start turbo. That's absolutely fine. Stop turbo. K. 
cancels Turbo Timeout. Okay. Start and stop Turbo, and then in Wire World, we have this. Um, rebuild engine function. I'm actually going to keep it around. Um, there might be reasons in the future that we want to adopt the while loop uh, pattern that we used for turbo, just because it's a little simpler than... Um, <clears throat> it's a little simpler than um, doing the loop pattern with set timeout. Um, like, the only reason that this is straightforward, right, is because Loop Turbo does the same work over and over again. But if the nature of the work changed, like if Loop Turbo, if, if, this, if this process was ongoing, um, then it kind of makes sense not to allow the event loop to butt in. so that the code that you write is synchronous and doesn't rely on, you know, like scheduling a time to pick up where it left off and keep number crunching or something like that. Anyway, rebuild engine, I'm gonna keep it around, um, but timing initialize, I'm going to get rid of that. And this is going to be Let's just look in timing again. Initialize, start turbo, stop turbo, perfect. So this is gonna become start turbo, and this is gonna become stop turbo. And actually we can do something like this. Just a little easier on the eyes. And then Let's try that. Are there any runtime errors? There are. Can't find variable turbo. And of course it's like somewhere in somewhere in the engine probably. Turbo. Okay, rather than guessing at what the problem is in um, in Safari, there we go. Engine JS one forty six. Thank you, Firefox. Forty six. There we go. Not Turbo, but Loop Turbo. Okay. There we go. Not bad. Um, approximately 1,000 generations per second. Okay. And prettier. Changed engine. Why did it change engine? White space. I don't care. Okay. Now engine. I should move these turbo specific uh, consts up to here. Turbo multiplier. Max frame time. Desired frame time. Turbo step size. Yep. What else? Um, you know, restored render. Yeah, I'll keep that in there too. It's funny, there's a lot of work that went into just supporting that while loop. 
and the ability to terminate and reinitialize a web worker for our engine that would take a previous render as like a starting point. And we're not even using it. It's just kind of funny. But that's the way the world works sometimes. I can get rid of this. Um, but something tells me that we might. Also, initialize, restored render, Reset, restored render. Here we go. Reset dot 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 event dot data dot args. There we go. Reset. Okay. This feels a little better to me just because if for whatever reason we want to trigger a reset from WireWorld.js, like maybe we want to bookmark a timestamp, right? Maybe there's a render that's like really cool that we want to get back to. This is a way that we could do that. Um, what else? Right, some of this stuff becomes invalid when Turbo is off. Um, and maybe we should do this, let turbo active equal false, and then just turbo, just, there we go, that feels better. Start turbo, turbo active equals true, stop turbo, turbo active equals false. Just feels better, you know? Don't overthink it. Okay. Prettier. That's all wrong. Turbo is inactive, then we do that. Otherwise. There we go. It's looking good. In my personal opinion, it's looking good. engine the engine no longer interrupts its web workers um, event loop so it no longer requires terminating and reinitializing when toggling turbo mode. So, some takeaways. Last episode we focused a lot on getting that funny looking while loop to do what we wanted it to do in the turbo loop. Instead of doing that, 
Sorry, hang on. Turbo multiplier. Not even using that. Okay. Just gonna quickly... Force push. <laughs> Okay, I gotta be careful doing that. Right. Cool. Um, no change there. Cool. So one of the advantages of having the web worker back in the event loop is this. Watch this. So you can see the web worker is going pedal to the metal, right? If we zoom in here, it doesn't look like there's any mo uh, movement in here because we have the turbo mode updating the generation six at a time. But if I click the step button, we can see it is advancing visibly. And that is because when we click the step button, it doesn't matter that turbo mode is on, it is still going to cause it to update um, on top of what it was already doing. Honestly, that's a nice feature in my book because it allows you to see some of the slower evolving systems, right? Like this ROM here. It allows you to step through the different states that it can be in without turning off turbo mode and pausing the sim. I like that a lot. Anyway. Um, what's next? Right. Just looking at these. I wonder if they're... Excuse me, I wonder if there is a benefit to... A couple episodes ago, a, um, a viewer in chat suggested that I write a for each for linked lists so that... Basically because at the time I was writing these for loops in... Not an initialize... Not there... Here we go, an update. I was writing these loops that are easy to get wrong. That involve these linked lists. And they suggested that maybe I create a class or something that does it instead. The only problem with that is the class would have to accept logic in here as an argument, which means making it a function, which means calling a function a bunch of times. I, I suspect that the performance that we're getting out of this update function partially... Wait a minute, start... Are we even using this? We're not. <laughs> okay. Um, like, if we look at this, pretty much everything we're doing in here is either a for loop, and we are manipulating the value that we declare in the for loop, or we are setting references fields, or we are performing numeric operations on fields. Yeah, pretty much everything we're doing here is a low-level JavaScript operation calling anything, 
Um, I wonder what removing that performance now will do. And negligible, negligible impact. Just gonna pop that up there. Be gone. Okay. So, what is off-screen canvas? Why do I have this word off-screen canvas here? Get rid of that. start with off-screen canvas though. So here is what off-screen canvas is. Uh, interesting. I am not in Japan. Experimental tech. Is it in a standard? There's, it's definitely not in a bunch of browsers. It is in Chrome. So really, we'll just be experimenting with a thing that's in Chrome. But is it not in any standard? It's in the HTML standard. OK. Click that. There it is. OK. So the whole point of off-screen canvas is to allow our web worker to basically GUI.js update paper. So basically everything that is in update paper and initialize paper could be done instead in the web worker. The canvases that we've got we would just kind of throw over the wall. Do I want to do that? It's, yeah, I've got the time. I will say this though, it is completely new to me it only works in one browser. <sighs> and I don't know how uh, it's going to go, but feel free to watch as I struggle. I have thought for a while now that it makes sense for GUI.js to not do this paper stuff. Get rid of these canvases we're not using. GUI JS. Why is initialize paper in GUI JS? I'm going to try. So by duplicating. GUI.js, uh, excuse me, one second. Thank you. 
Right, back again. Where were we? <laughs> GUI.js is a pretty big file, huh? Actually, let me compare that to Wireworld.js. Not that big. Timing, not that big. Engine, pretty big, but that kind of makes sense. Data is extremely small. GUI utils is surprisingly big. Yeah, there's a lot going on in there, but that's because of Make Slider. How much of this is Make Slider? All of this is Make Slider. Wow. Pan zoom is long, but it has a complex responsibility. Pan zoom does this. This zoom and this pan, which can happen at the same time. And on multi-touch devices, uh, one finger does pan, two fingers do zoom, and letting go of either finger does pan again, and while you're zooming, you're panning. You get the idea. It's like Google Maps. Um, and actually, the um, I might be adjusting it to be more like the user experience people have learned to expect from map applications. Like the tap, you know, the, the tap gesture where you tap and then press and drag your finger around is supposed to be like an in-place zoom. Anyway, GUI utils, GUI. I feel like a whole bunch of GUI has nothing to do with what is represented in state, and that is an indication. Initial state. There we go. Generation, sim speed, playing, playing under pop up, turbo speed. None of that has to do with the paper. Paper being the thing that contains the two canvases. So I think I'm going to create paper.js and Wireworld will import paper from paper.js. And then GUI, this is paper.update. And then Paper dot initialize update paper cool. I feel like that's what should be going on. And then maybe this goes into paper too. Anyway, just because I can duplicate GUI and paper doesn't mean they can be the same file. So GUI doesn't have to worry about that, or that, or that. Reset. What does reset do? Set file path. Nothing. Okay. And so initialize paper is just going to become initialize, and update paper is just going to become update. Cool. Paper. Delete that. Update. Initialize drawings. Yup. Whole bunch of gooey stuff. Labels. Tons of stuff. Show pop up, hide pop up, initial state. None of that matters in this case. We don't care about pop ups. We don't care about any of that. Collect UI. Okay. 
Collect UI could go into GUI utils then. What else are we not using? We're not using set pin zoom size. Right? Oh, we are. Hmm. Um, that's fine. You know what? That's fine. Or is it? Reset file name. Yeah, it's fine. Basically, GUI.js is going to... Let's see, set pan zoom size. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So the paper calls set pen zoom size, and GUI does not. Okay, I'm gonna shove collect GUI into GUI utils. Uh, oh, collect UI, that's what it's called. Um, and then in here, paper is also gonna get collect UI. And then GUI utils, uh, collect UI, const collect UI, cool. Collect UI is a utility function that grabs, so there's a query, there's like a selector. Um, it queries the document for all of those and it maps those into a into an object where the key for everything is its class lists first uh, entry with all the minus signs replaced with underscores kind of like what we saw with that um, simulation speed label at the beginning of the episode it's pretty handy and it shouldn't just be in GUI now that paper also can use it make event target What's this used for? Nothing. What's this used for? State dot. Interesting. I see. Okay. Paper has a state. Do I care? No, I do not care. So, GUI generation. Simulation speed, just gonna get rid of those. Yep. And then in here, this is gonna be zero, and this is gonna be that. It is a fair assumption that Yeah, we'll we'll performance test with this, but I'm not too worried about it. Okay. Dot generation. Uh, so in GUI.js, we're going to get rid of all of this stuff that has nothing to do with the GUI. There we go. Um, update paper and initialize paper are gone. Generation simulation speed gone. Cool. Cool. Okay. Cell state does not matter here. Collect UI is used. Although canvases and paper are not, I believe. Yeah, that's not used. That's not used. Great. Make event target. Is UI element. Yep. Make slider, of course. Map key to mouse event, of course. Cell state is, of course, in use. Collect UI is in use. Make event target is not. Is UI element is not. Make slider is not. Make map key to mouse event is not. Cool. Params is not in use. 
state, we don't really care about. State changed event, advanced event, gone. Collect UI gone. Okay. Let's see what we just did. And for now, I'm going to hide activity monitor. Okay. Can't declare a const variable twice, paper. Const paper. There it is. Okay. Oh, this isn't even used either. Load failed. Can't find variable labels. That makes sense. Um, GUI JS labels. What is this? Right. Okay. Interesting. I think this is fine. Um, it is duplicate work. State dot generation simulation speed. Yeah, that looks good. So all we've done is isolate the paper How much longer do I want to keep calling this paper? Hang on. There's probably a better name for it. Come on, Rez. Paper, paper, paper. I mean, another word for it would be document, but document is taken because we're in HTML. I will think that over. Is there a better word than paper? One reason paper is called this is because that's the name I gave it 10, you know, 10 or 11 years ago. Let's change the colors up again. It's been a while. I don't know, it's just not as fun, is it? Like, it kind of looks like circuitry, but... I don't know. I think the old colors stand out better. All of which is beside the point. Um, let's also see what happens. Let's just check and make sure.
<laughs> By the way, I think this is worth pointing out. Um, <laughs> when the simulation is this small, the speed of the simulation is enormous. How big is this? I should put commas in, actually. Um, what's it called? MDN International Number Format. Intel Number Format. Run. Very nice. Uh, basic usage, number format, former num format number. Yes, that's what I want. And I will just drop one into the engine. Const uh, number formatter equals new. Yes. And then Number formatter dot format. This is becoming a very long. Okay, hang on. Let simulation speed equal that. If turbo active simulation speed equals format math dot round. This is a little easier to read, I think. And I'll just do a thousand times that. There we go. So if I just go in here and drop this guy, turn on turbo, <laughs> the simulation speed is 3.7 million generations per second. generation should be up here we're going to do number formatter generation set text um, oh paper my bad hmm you know what? No. Generation in paper is just going to be in quotes zero. Generation set text. So rather than generation, this is going to be format generation and then the rest there we go that's kind of nice I do wonder what its impact is on performance, but only a little bit. And now if we drop in tail. Jeez. Although 
I might have just discovered a bug. If I drag and drop this in. Okay, turbo is still on. But it says it's not. Cardick, how's it going? Thanks for dropping by. Just fixing up a bug in a weird web app. Um, so, the problem is the reset. turbo equals turbo. Oh yeah, your first uh, your first time checking out Twitch from the side of somebody with an account. I don't know how to make chat work with or like a like voice chat work or anything like that. So that's probably not in the cards tonight, but um, here we go. Let me just, sorry, one second. Block, drop it. Cool, okay. So now turbo and speed are preserved from the, uh... I'm glad you think so. Let me just run pretty real quick. There we are. Right. Boy, that's a lot of changes. Hang on. Right, and then paper is brand spanking new. in here. Yeah, a little bit of editing. Okay. Isolated paper from GUI module. Um, fixed a bug where the turbo state was reset when loading a new file. So at least now, when I struggle to figure out what I'm doing with off-screen canvas, I only have to look at the code inside of Paper.js and Wireworld uh, and Engine. <sighs> what am I doing? <clears throat> I'm going back to MDN. So at least it's... Oops. There we go. So at least it's in a spec. We need to detect it. Right, so off-screen canvas interface provides a canvas that can be rendered off-screen. It is available in both the window and worker contexts. And so the idea is paper has these canvases. Um, it wraps them up in some other data and it calls them drawings, which is fine. That makes sense. Right, there's base drawing and there's active drawing. Huh. You know what? We're going to simplify this. We know that there's only two of these. So, drawings... Const make drawing 
equal. Sorry if you hear a, uh, hear a siren right now. There's a uh, some I think ambulance traffic going by my window. Right. So from entries, map ID canvas. Okay. So ID canvas. Ah, oh, that happens each time we initialize. Yeah, this is fine. Make drawing, yep. So, canvas width, canvas height. Um, so we're gonna say, um, let base drawing, active drawing, Drawings equals, and then in here, right, we get rid of this, base drawing equals, make drawing, what is this ID used for? Yeah, no need for that. Just give me this. Make drawing canvases dot what are they called? Base and active. Dot base active drawing is dot active base drawing active drawing and that means this can go and this can go. Is these canvases are always around. So presumably I'll only hand them off to the uh, to the engine once. Uh, the app on startup. Good question. Oh. <laughs> Give me one second. Uh, old bounds dot width. Zoom. Yeah, sorry, one sec. What I'll do is load it from the web. There we go. So this is the Wireworld computer, which was designed by um, David Moore and Mark Owen in like 1992 or something. They, it wasn't written up until 2004. Um, and if you go to quinopolis.com, here, I'll just paste this in chat. Okay, it won't allow me to. There we go. Okay. So, the basics about how this stuff is uh, arranged and what each part does is all written up in that uh, document. Um, the digits that you're seeing are basically the display of a computer. This whole thing is a computer. This is the RAM, this is the ROM, or sorry, there's no ROM. This is the RAM. <laughs> Down here is the ALU, which is the math, like the, the, the parts of the processor that just do math. Down here is the system clock. And this, this topmost register uh, is the output. And so um, a single number can be sent down here 
into this binary to decimal converter. And then the decimal numbers, um, is it decimal? I mean, it's decimal, but it's like one, two, three, four, five. It turns a binary number into five unary quantities, I think. And so here, let me, let me see if that's actually true. So like these signals are, yeah, I'm not 100% sure what the base is of the quantity that goes in here, but this is a bit of ROM and it turns those signals, zero through nine, into um, signals of which segment to light up in each of these uh, numbers. So while this could be a counter, um, it's really used for whatever, um, whatever number is stored in memory up here. And the Wireworld computer happens to be programmed right now to solve for prime numbers. So when we set it running, Oh yeah, glad you found it. So you can predict what numbers are here. Two is hard-coded, according to the authors. Um, and you can see the digit two, uh, you know, going down this uh, this lead, this, this link from the computer to the display. And at some point it's gonna change to three, which should be two electrons right next to each other. Still two. Any sec there we go, now it's three. And the number three goes through the binary to decimal converter, and bam, three. I imagine that you can predict the next few quantities that come out of this. I promise it runs a whole lot faster when I'm not streaming and recording at the same time. Um, Another thing is, uh, for the first few episodes, I was recording at way too small a um, way too small a resolution for it to make sense to record in the first place. I don't know what you mean for sure by constantly in resonance, but I think what you mean is there's a loop here in memory, and that loop is constantly sent over and over and over again to the binary to decimal converter, which is sort of like how a computer will send a video signal uh, over and over, even if it hasn't changed. As for these signals, uh, as I was saying, your best bet is to read the, uh, the web page from uh, Dr. Moore. Or no, Dr. Owen. Who runs Quinopolis? One second. It is... Mark Owen. Okay. Dr. Owen. Yeah, let me know what you mean by the frames in a bunch of latches. Um, one of my friends who contributed to uh, my strategy for optimizing last episode uh, suggested that there is a downside to implementing the turbo uh, rate adjustment like this, which is that um, there's no guarantee that the step size is going to stay like the faster the step size goes the more likely the simulation is going to oscillate rapidly between this if statement where it has to slow things down and this statement where it has to double it ah uh, yeah yep Ugh. i do not have an ergonomic setup one second Right. Ugh. 
Where was I? Oh, right. So, I broke something locally, and it's time to figure out what. Can't find numb bites. Paper numb bites. Ah, that's why. So, numb bites is width times height, height times four. So, I can just take this and bring it up. Like that. It's the only place where it's used, so... Eh, it's good. Okay, load. And it's happy again. Cool. And then... Drag and drop. Cool. Okay. Um... Let me see how off-screen uh, off canvas actually works. So there's a constructor. Get context, convert to blob. I don't think we care about that. Transfer to image bitmap creates an image bitmap object from the most recently rendered image. I don't think I care about that either. So new frame is finished. Okay, so I see. Transfer to image bitmap is basically a way of saying, okay, this canvas is off screen, so don't show the stuff that it's doing. Whereas we actually want our canvas to be directly rendered to from the worker. So... Here we are. Okay. Transfer control to off screen. This is how we're going to detect whether it's even possible. HTML canvas dot transfer control to off screen. So here, canvas console dot log. Oops. <laughs> this. Let's see what Safari thinks is on there. Undefined. Perfect. So, if canvas transfer control off screen isn't null, then we do the fun stuff. And the fun stuff we will grab from here. Off screen. Okay. Let off screen equal null. Off screen gets a value if transfer control to off screen exists. Worker is new worker. Post message canvas off screen. MDN web worker post message. I have to figure out what that entails with it in the second transfer. An optional array of transferable objects to transfer ownership of. Ah, okay. I see. That is where we throw it over the wall. So, off screen, canvas transfer control to off screen. Huh. Is there an opposite to this? Oopsie. Once the canvas element has become a placeholder for an off-screen canvas object, its intrinsic size, rats, can no longer be changed and it cannot have a rendering context. 
The content of the placeholder canvas is updated by calling the commit method of off-screen canvas. This isn't bad, it's just awkward. Because I'm calling make drawing every single time a new file is loaded. I'm going to change this back to this. Um. Initialize. Aha. Okay. Here's what I'll do. Um. Initialize and update won't be called. So right now they're called from paper.initialize from here and from here, paper update. That's happening because We will guard against that. We'll say hmm. there's going to be a duplication of code, unfortunately. I'll try to refactor it once I actually get it working, though. So. In here, we're going to say um, and instead of width and height, we're going to say one comma one. No, we're not. We're going to leave that alone, and we're going to say um, const off-screen. Yeah, here we go. Const off-screen base off-screen drawing equals make off-screen drawing. Um, canvases dot base. Okay. And this one becomes active. And then down here, initialize update base off screen drawing, uh, active off screen drawing. And the idea is those are going to be null unless const make off screen drawing equals canvas with height. Right. We're going to grab this transfer control to off screen. We're going to say if canvas transfer control to off screen. Oh, we don't need width and height. And this is actually, this is going to be. Okay, we don't need, we don't actually need a method. We can just say, what is it? Nullish function call MDN. Optional chaining for methods. I just 
it's easy to forget this. There we go. Question mark dot. Question mark dot. There we go. Okay. If off-screen drawing is supported, then these things will have values. So initialize is going to be like um, if base, base off-screen drawing is null, return. Same thing with active down here. If active off-screen drawing isn't null, return. And we're not expecting these functions to be called because WireWorldJS is going, excuse me, is going to avoid calling them unnecessarily. I mean, it might as well call paper initialize. I'm not bothered by that at all. Engine gets the data, cool. Um, and also, when we rebuild the engine, here we go. Engine is new worker. Engine dot post message type off screen canvases args base paper dot base off screen canvas. We're just going to expand this. Active paper active off screen canvas. And then, just like it was saying, these are transferables. And so we are going to transfer them like that. I'm not sure what happens to transferables once you terminate, but we're not terminating right now, so we'll cross that bridge when we reach it. Base off screen, oopsie, off screen. It should be off screen. Paper. Oh. Not off screen drawing. We're going to call them off screen canvas. There we are. Base off screen canvas, active off screen canvas. Engine. Case. What's it called? Wire World is sending off screen canvases. Off screen canvases. I'm going to send this up here to the top. Break. Um, this. Transfer control to off screen. Transferable. Nope. Here we go. On message event canvas get perfect. Okay. Event data canvas. That's that. Okay. So um, set up canvases. Event dot data dot args. Here with initialize const initialize. Oops. Set up canvases equals, and we're expecting base off screen canvas active off screen canvas. And you know what? We're just going to immediately do a post message. Post message. Thanks. Oh. Right, type debug args thanks. And then in Wireworld, we're going to listen to the web worker for debug messages. Console.log. Oh, there we 
we are. Yeah. Type error in post message. What's the matter? Comment this out. It is happy. Interesting. I wonder if we. There we go. It's happy with that. And here's where it throws an error. So, my guess is because these are null in Safari, console.log base off screen canvas is like undefined or something. Oh, whoops. Uh, paper dot base off screen canvas. It's undefined. <clears throat> so it's unhappy with things in here that are undefined. So dot filter. Um, Canvas, canvas isn't null. There we go. The engine says, thanks for the canvas. So, um, console, oh, no need for that. Okay, so these could both be null. Um, base off screen canvas equals null. Uh, no good. Otherwise, thanks. No good. And in Firefox, it'll probably say the same. Nope. Import not found collect UI. Oh, because I need to clear the cache or something. There we go. Engine, no good. So neither of those browsers support off-screen canvas. Clear cache. In Chrome. And Chrome says no good. Interesting. I was not expecting that. Let me just dock this. Ah, here we go. Oh, no, no, no. That's not a problem. Although pan zoom does need to be initialized. That's right. So in paper... Um, pan zoom... Set pan zoom size. This... Actually, all of these need to go up here. Okay, so actually it's a good thing that we're calling initialize anyway. There we are. Yep. Interesting. So I'm going to find out console.log base off screen canvas has a value it has a value so in wire world one second <laughs> excuse me Base off screen canvas, we need to find out console.log base off, oops, paper dot base off screen canvas. Again, it has a value.
post message. Okay, here's what I'll do instead. Arcs. Um, failed to execute. An off-screen canvas could not be cloned because it was not transferred. My bad. Um, okay, so that suggests that... Oh, for Pete's sake. Okay, hang on. This should be not equal to null. Or no, sorry. Base off base off screen canvas is null. Ugh. Here's what I'll do instead. Args becomes object dot object dot keys. Base active. Oh, that's why. This is called base, this is called active. Okay. Um. I just think this is more straightforward. There we go. So now in Chrome, we've got the canvases. Engine.js is not a module because um, the versions of Firefox and Safari that I support don't necessarily allow for module syntax in web workers. So we're going to have to um, duplicate some stuff. a lot. So this is an interesting question, right? Like, why, why, why? Chrome support off-screen canvas and let me rewrite this. No, let me just say it out loud. So we've got this situation. Uh, Firefox has no off-screen canvas and it has also Safari also um, no off-screen canvas and no module syntax in web workers, at least for the versions that I've got on my machine. Chrome supports both, off-screen canvas module syntax. At the moment, to support all three, Engine.js has no module syntax. If you're going to support off-screen canvas, but you know that not every browser can, the tricky thing is, in Chrome's quiet, private world, both of these things 
are perfect because basically the module that you would run on the main thread to handle these canvases is the same module that you would run in your web worker with the module syntax. I don't have that luxury because I'm supporting browsers that do not support uh, module syntax and web workers. The reason this doesn't generally cause the web to break for most developers is because if you're using off-screen canvas and you're messing with module syntax, chances are you work for some giant megacorp where you can use the latest and greatest JavaScript uh, features um, and everything gets compiled down to a JavaScript file or two or three that support the least common denominator. Um, Babel is an example. Uh, one second. Uh, Babel, JS, and Webpack um, are examples of bundlers that take the stuff that is written in ECMAScript modules and pulls it together, and on top of that, makes sure that it can run in older engines. I'm trying not to do that, right? Let's look at the ethos again. This and every other project I intend to do on stream utilizes the Binge Vanilla um, uh, ethos. I want zero frameworks so that if somebody else wants to do what I'm doing or wants to build off of what I've done, you don't have to pull in a bunch of dependencies that also have their own versions and their own bug fixes and their own security vulnerabilities and impose their own stuff. On top of that, I want to be able to use modern features. And for the most part, I've been able to get away with that. Unfortunately, by using a web worker, I have had to um, uh, compromise on modular syntax in the engine. And the other stuff comes down to personal convention and discipline. And running prettier as often as I want. So my hands are kind of tied. The only way that I can think of supporting off-screen canvases in Chrome is by copy-pasting the text, the, the, the code, in Paper.js, which is more or less what I've done with cell state, which normally sits in Data.js. Right? Like, this is a, a, a module, and Engine.js cannot import it. I could write a very gross function to kind of import that stuff. Let me let me think about that. Web worker import scripts probably can take a blob. HTML document base URL. Okay. MDN worker, sorry, web worker import scripts. Oh, this is so gross. Um, blob. Okay. Okay, people are accomplishing this. So here's something I could do. For each module that I want to import into my web worker, I could f I could fetch it as text and then apply a regular expression to it to Wait, no, I can't because of the import statements. I could use an ex I could use a regex to turn the export statement into something more palatable, but those import statements are where I get stuck. Okay, 
No, my hands are tied. Shoot. Okay, here's what I'll do. Paper.js gets paper worker. .js. Oops. Paper dash worker. .js. And then engine can import scripts from there. Import scripts. I think js slash paperworker.js. And then paperworker can just be. We don't need those. We don't need these. Don't need this. In fact, paper.js doesn't need that. Cell state, okay. States to colors. Yeah, forget this. What a pain in the... Okay, cell state gone from paper. This becomes dead color. This becomes const color equals, and this becomes... Hang on. I can almost get away with that. Cell state. This becomes dead color. Yep. And then state. Let's see. Color equals, here we go, dead color, otherwise wire color. And then down here, states to colors. I think that already exists, doesn't it? Tail color, yeah, it does. Oh, paper worker. Just cut that out. Oh, that's interesting. There we go. Okay. Still works. Good to see. Just gonna copy paper JS and paste it into paper worker again. Um, right, we don't need these, we don't need these. We do need is little endian. Okay, if we end up supporting off-screen canvas, then I resolve in the next episode to try and refactor. Because this is a lot of stuff that we're carrying over. Const paper, we don't need those. Initialize. Um, Right, so this becomes... Hmm, hang on. 
off screen. Width and height, off screen width. So you can set it. Okay. Cool. Okay. So this becomes. Oh no. <laughs> okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Paper JS initialize. We still need to do this work. Okay. Size canvas, canvases dot base with height. I wonder if this is even possible, whether they can be resized this way while there's an off screen canvas. I guess there's one way to find out. There we go. Fail to set width. Cannot resize canvas after call to transfer control to off screen. Okay, so in that case, resize canvas. Okay, so that got rid of the DOM exception, and then failed to whirl to load paper worker. Okay, we're doing this one more time. These aren't necessary. Resize canvas. to set the style. Make drawing. Sure. Base drawing, active drawing, we don't worry about those. Initialize data. Okay, canvases. Let canvases. and then canvases equals data. Weird, okay. Can get rid of that. So, for inside the worker, we're going to pass the off-screen canvases like that. And so actually, in here, we will call these base and active engine set up canvases and these are just going to be called canvases
paper.set canvases canvases. That's fine. So then in paper worker, instead of it being in here, const set canvases. What is set up canvases? Nope, set canvases equals new canvases. Canvases equals new canvases. And then in here, set canvases. Cool. In engine, set canvases. Okay. Heck, we'll call it setup instead. Okay. Resize, make drawing. Okay. Let's try this again in here. Error, of course. Response is not two double X. Oh, right, cell state. Um, just gonna leave that out. 404. Let's try it in Chrome. Failed to execute import scripts. Oh, okay. Engine should leave JS out of here. Maybe just dot slash. Setup canvases has already been declared. Right, 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 right. Oh, right. Shoot. Okay. So paper. Hang on. All of this. Jeez Louise. Okay. Const paper equals. And then we are doing some weird ass. Oh, I just cursed, sorry. There we go. Just some weird construction. function uh, let has off screen canvases equal false function that when called says whether this thing here just has canvases. Const has canvases equals canvases dot Base isn't null and canvases 
dot active isn't null. There we go. Cool. So then in engine, in render, we're going to say, let's see, so we still need to send that. We don't need to send these though. Okay. If has canvases, else. Okay, so that saves us some work in the render function. Because these indices aren't going to be populated anyway. And then in here, paper dot update with this data. doesn't have canvases, cool, then we need to populate these. If has canvases, oh whoops, paper dot has canvases, paper update with this data. You know what, for now, we're just going to do this, okay, and as a matter of fact, we're not too worried about whether it has canvases after all. It has canvases, and no, this does save us the, uh, dot has canvases. There we go. So we don't send some data over the uh, barrier unnecessarily. Uh, we do need to initialize though. So initialize. dot initialize. What am I sending? Probably the same data that came in. Yeah. Let's try this. Engine line 62. Oh. off-screen canvas is not defined. Right. Resize. We don't care about that. Yep. We don't care about that. We don't care about that. Labels. Labels, set pan zoom, okay, let's try that, pixels of undefined, make drawing, base drawing, make drawing, let's see. Ought to work. Line seventy. Interesting. Okay. So maybe the engine is calling update before. 
before it's calling Yep, that's why. Paper initialize has to come before reset. There we go. It's cool that it's doing it all off screen, but um I don't know, time will tell. I will need to uh, I will need to assess the performance of this thing um, after the stream, because the stream cool. Because this, um, because as I was saying, the, the streaming software uh, that's also recording um, makes it difficult to actually assess the performance of this thing. Does it still work here? Undefined is not an object. Maybe Firefox will help me figure out what the heck that's about. Canvas is undefined. Resize canvas. From initialize. Canvases.base. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, huh. Ah, right, right, right. And paper worker, um, if canvases is null, return. And also in update, if canvases is null, return. Canvas is undefined in paper worker again. This is... Oh, that's why. Okay. Um... Base is null. The active is null. Return. There we go. What a mess. That said, at least now I can say I have used an off-screen worker once in my lifetime. In a few years, it might be a viable... Um, I don't know. What what is the point of this? The time it took the main thread to render what was being sent from the web worker was minuscule. Also, it's interesting. that Oh, 
Oh, right. So in paper, here we go. This needs to be moved down to here. There we go. So now Chrome should update its speedometer. It's not. Console.log. Why is an update being called? That's why. Cache again. Um, it's not very fast, and that makes sense because now the off-screen worker is competing with the engine's regular code in the thread that they both coexist in, so that, that makes no sense. I could make an off-screen worker... Sorry, I could make an off-screen canvas and pass it to a third web worker. I could do that. What I've written tonight is is a bad idea, but I could potentially make a third worker. Okay. To do, off-screen canvas. Try making a third worker that just renders to the Engine sends render data to main thread and off-screen canvas worker. It's a whole lot of work just for one target at the moment. Like, by the time off-screen canvas becomes widely adopted, presumably uh, module syntax and web workers will also be adopted because they tend to go hand in hand. The projects that take advantage of one typically take advantage of the other. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put all of this work What did I delete in here? States to colors. So I'll also do this in master, but the work that we've done tonight, I'm going to put in a branch called experiment with off-screen canvas. And this is, oopsie, this is going to say um, added off-screen canvas detection and support at the cost of code maintainability. At the moment, the engine and paper worker share a thread, so the performance is also worse. Good times. But there it is in a branch. Back in master, I am going to not worry about any of that. Um, I mean, I will, um, just as a reminder, I will there you are. There we go. So that's in there. Paperworker doesn't exist anymore. Engine, Wireworld. Okay. States to colors does not matter. States to colors, dead color, states to colors, color equals dead color, otherwise wire color. And 
these can just go away. And we test that real quick. Cool. And prettify. that. Removed states to colors from paper. Didn't have to be there in the first place. Oh, I should probably, uh, here we go. How many branches have I got on? I've got Headmaster Parse Performance. Well, that's ancient. It's from March. Alternative implementations of Parse MCL. Whatever. Um, all right. Well, I've reached a stopping point, and we are three minutes from 9.30. The skybox's sun has set, and the moon has followed it over the horizon. I've got a really sore arm, and I would like to do something about it, so I'm going to wrap things up for this stream from the skybox in the corner of the level. Thank you very much for hanging out and catching up. Um, I'm not sure yet what the next, uh, what the next episode is going to be. But I'll be sure to clue you in in my tweet and uh, Mastodon to uh, in the coming week. Oh, and friendly reminder, if you're in a place where you can vote, and it's time to vote, which is the case here in the skybox, Please consider voting. You might just feel like you're one pixel in a vast wire world simulation, but even a single pixel can make a big difference. All right, see ya.